Thanks, thanks, Xavier, for, for having me back here. So yeah, I, yeah I, I recognize a lot of the faces here, and it's great to be back for those of you um, if we don't know each other. So yeah, I was here a few years ago. Um, and yeah, and I'm going to talk to you about the work that I've been doing at NYU across uh, a number of different projects. So there's actually, there's kind of a lot that I want to talk to you about today, um, which means that I won't necessarily be able to go into a lot of detail about some of the specific techniques or the details of those techniques. Um, but I'm more than happy to take questions. So if at any point you have a question, please just feel free to stop me. And I'm also happy to have conversations offline at the end of the talk as well. So I guess this will be a little overview -y in the sense that there's a lot, a lot of ground to cover, but I'm always happy to, to discuss things in greater detail. The other thing I'll just mention um, before I start is that even though my name's here on the slide, um, all of this work was done in collaboration with a lot of great people, including people here at the MTG. I started listing everyone and then it just kind of scrolled down from the bottom of the slide. So in the end I decided to, um, to just not include it. But yeah, this is work that has been done with collaboration with a lot of great people. So there are kind of two main themes I want to talk about today. Machine listening in urban and bioacoustic environments, um, which has been perhaps the main theme of my work for the last few years but also about another thread of work that kind of we've been uh, working a lot on at the Music and Audio Research Lab, which is Tools for Sustainable MIR Research. Um, music information retrieval, but also just audio research, audio analysis research more in general. Um, also, I'm going to assume certain familiarity here with the domain, with the techniques, but if at any point um, something is not familiar to you, you have questions, you want further explanations, please by all means feel free to stop me and just ask. So starting with, um, starting with uh, the first half of the talk, but maybe just very quickly, who is this person uh, here? Ah, this is kind of going a little eerie. Okay, I'll skip this slide. I wonder. Okay. Basically, it was a bit of my own trajectory. I'm originally from Israel, did my undergrad in the UK, did my master's and PhD here, and now at NYU. So we can easily skip that. And then the other thing I'm going to skip is are the things that I'm not going to talk about today. So as Xavier mentioned, I spent a lot of my time working on melody extraction. Um, Angel. Where the basic idea was, you know, you have a melody in a polyphonic piece of music, you want to extract the F0 trajectory of that melody. Um, Towards the end, we could start doing some fun things with those trajectories, like replacing it with a vocaloid synthesis of the same melody. Um, and we worked on a whole bunch of other fun things whilst uh, I was here, like cover ID and genre classification, pan discovery, tonic identification. So I'm not going to talk about any of that. What I am going to talk about is mainly in the context of these two projects, OK? Sonic. Uh, which stands for Sounds of New York City, very much inspired by Sons La Barcelona. Um, um, and then BirdVox, which is a similar project that we have in terms of analyzing sound using machine learning techniques, except that Sonic, the focus is on urban sound and noise. And in BirdVox, it's about bioacoustics, it's about studying birds. And it's a collaboration with Cornell University um, with the goal of uh, studying bird migration patterns. So these two projects will kind of fill the first half of my talk, or maybe the first two thirds. Um, and then the second half will be about these tools for audio, um, for audio research that we've been developing, MIR Eval, Jams, Scaper, Audio Annotator, and Massage. So um, Sonic is this big project. It has a lot of moving parts. It has acoustic sensing. It has machine listening. It has data science working with the analysis of the machine listening component. And so there are a lot of moving parts here. And today I will very much focus on this part here in the middle, on the machine listening part. Um, and by machine listening, I generally mean extracting semantically meaningful information from audio signals. And as you will see, in our case, it's really about identifying the presence or absence of different types of, of sound sources from, from a signal. So I'll 
The way I'll present it is a bit kind of giving the historical arch of the different steps that we went through uh, in our research. But um, to make sure that nobody kind of gets impatient as I go through this, um, spoiler alert, uh, it's covered. Okay, basically the spoiler is deep convolutional neural networks with a lot of data kind of win the day. Um, the second spoiler that I just added was that actually we have some new results very recently that haven't been published yet, and so I'm going to give you a sneak peek of, of what we, we kind of what we have very recently. So throughout this talk, there will be four, I think, um, overarching problems or topics, right, that will kind of be transversal through working with birds, working with jackhammers, working with cars. Um, one is about signal representations, right? And that's basically how do we work with the audio signal to get it to a place where it's amenable for machine learning. Um, the other one are about the models themselves, the specific architectures. Um, then a big topic we've been working with is the issue of data, data scarcity, the problem of not having enough data. Um, this, of course, we started working on this a lot before audio set happened, before Google released that. Um, so things have, the picture has slightly changed now, but I think that a lot of this is still relevant, still applicable. And then um, there are some real world challenges in terms of actually getting these systems to work in the real world, deploy them out there, um, which I will not focus on too much. Okay, so this is a kind of my why even do we care about urban sound or urban noise, right? Why, why should we even bother with this topic? So um, it's been estimated that in New York City alone, 9 out of 10 adults, so almost everyone is exposed to harmful levels of noise. So if you've been to New York before, you will probably have noticed that the city is super loud. It's just noisy all the time. Um, and that's, um, and there have been, yeah, over, like over 3 million complaints since, since 2003. So New York City has this service called 311, where you can call and complain about stuff. It can be your neighbors making noise, it can be that they haven't removed the garbage from your street, it can be that there's a hole in the road, but it can also be about noise. And it actually turns out that noise is the number one complaint. It's the number one thing that people complain about in 311. And the number of complaints just keep growing from year to year. Um, now, many people say, oh, okay, so people complain about it, but noise, it's not really a big deal. Well, um, turns out that noise is a big deal. There's um, some scientific studies that actually link noise to health, serious health problems like sleeping loss, hearing loss. And when you suffer from these things, you obviously are less productive at work. And so there are also studies linking noise pollution to drop in productivity, um, increased stress. Um, and uh, learning impairment in children. So basically when children are in schools that are surrounded by very noisy environments, that can actually influence how well they do in school. Um, this is my own little personal anecdote. So I'm, uh, I'm a data point in my data set because this is the truck full of all of my stuff when I moved apartments because I couldn't take it anymore. Um, my first apartment in Brooklyn was in a very, very, very noisy area and it got to the point where it was just became unlivable and so we had to pack our stuff and move. So I've kind of experienced noise also firsthand. So we say, okay, so noise is a big city, is a big problem in New York, we want to tackle this, but we want to tackle it in a data-driven, scientific fashion. Before we can start making up methods and techniques, we probably have to understand how does the city work with noise right now. So we looked into it, and let's say you're in the city, you have these things, let's call them noise sources, right? AC units, dogs, garbage trucks. Um, however, it's important to remember that these things, perhaps with the exception of the dog, in of themselves, they won't just start making noise, right? These are all operated by humans. So the humans are the kind of critical part in the loop. So we have these humans, they operate these things that make noise, and that in turn contaminates our acoustic environment. Now, right now, as a citizen, um, your only option is to basically file a complaint through 311. That complaint, if it's, uh, if it's some types of complaints, will go to uh, NYPD, but most of the complaints will go to the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection. Okay, and they will then, if they have time, will send an inspector, and then the inspector will try and issue some sort of ticket. Um, 
as you might imagine, there are um, a lot of inefficiencies with this, pro with this process. So um, first of all, the reporting system is sparse and bias, right? Sparse because not everybody complains about noise when there is noise and bias because it actually turns out that some studies show that people living in richer neighborhoods tend to complain more than people living in poor neighborhoods. So actually the, kind of the, the higher expectation you have for quality of life, the more likely you are to complain about noise, which means that this is by no means a mirror of how much noise there actually is in the city. Um, and then the other problem is that the scheduling of inspections is ad hoc, right? They get complaints and then if someone is free, they send them to a certain location, but there's no, there's no strategy behind scheduling, these, um, behind scheduling these inspections and consequently what happens is they end up with a very poor hit rate because most of the time, by the time they get there, the noise is gone, right? So they can't issue a ticket, they can't issue a fine because there's, there's nothing to observe. So, you know, our question was, well, can we do better? How can we try and fix this? Um, and so what we basically add is a layer on top of the existing system. So one thing that was important for us is not to come and say, we're going to replace everyone and everything using technology, but rather we're going to enhance the existing process with technology. So if before you only had citizens reporting, now we're adding a system of, <laughs> of sensors, of acoustic sensors that are constantly monitoring the environment and transmitting that information to our kind of main data center where we can perform analysis, pattern recognition, identify patterns of noise over time and space. And using that information, we can then inform the city's inspectors um, to optimize their chances of actually observing a noise violation, right? If our system measures that every Thursday between 8 and 8.30, there is a jackhammer happening at location X, then we can actually start building predictive models and say, your greatest likelihood of observing a noise violation will be Thursday next week between 8 and 8.30 in, in this location. Okay. So anyway, this is just all the spiel about everything that's involved in doing this. So another way to look at Sonic is like uh, a cyber physical system or loop with three main components. You have sensing, analysis, and actuation. Actuation is important, right? If we just keep this as a pie-in-the-sky research project and we never actually work on getting our information in the hands of those people who can actually then go out and issue tickets and act on the information, the whole project remains hypothetical. However, by ensuring that from the get-go we're working in collaboration with city agencies like the DEP, we can really try and get to the point where our system has some real impact. So, over the last few years, um, the two main components that we've been developing, now there are many more, um, were the sensing side, which is just the physical hardware sensor. Um, and that looks something like this. This was mainly developed by my colleague, a postdoc named Charlie Midlars. There's a Raspberry Pi in there. The microphone component is this. It looks like this. So actually there's the, the green board here is the microphone. Um, the microphone itself is a MEMS microphone. It's tiny, they're printed like chips. And so the board just adds some extra uh, post-processing on the signal to kind of get rid of the uh, uh, inherent frequency response of the microphone so that we get a nice flat response and also doing some tricks to avoid electromagnetic interference and this kind of stuff. And then it's mounted on this 3D printed gray thing. I never really knew what the name for it is. But the point is that this is both a mount, it also protects it from rain a little bit if it starts raining, and the holes in the sides are, are to ensure that we don't get any funky resonances uh, inside the mount that then affect the signal that we get from the microphone. And so uh, that's uh, our sensor. Here you can see a picture of one of these mounted in New York City. Um, we have close to 50 of these uh, in different locations in the city now. The hope is to get to 100 as part of our kind of pilot, um, pilot project with this. And so the point is these sensors, they can already measure decibel levels, right? They can measure how loud something is. But the problem is if you only measure how loud something is and you don't know what that thing actually is, how can you reliably start developing strategies to mitigate it, right? If something, you don't know if something loud was a dog barking or a person or a car passing by or construction. And the whole point is to collect this data at a large scale from the entire city to really try and build statistical models of these noise patterns to develop large strategies, broad strategies for mitigating noise. So you can think about it 
only measuring dB levels in the image world would be the equivalent of only giving you the average color of an entire image as one pixel, right? When actually what you care about is what's in the image. And that's why the problem that I've been focusing on for the last few years is source identification, right? Which basically means given a, a signal, an audio recording, automatically identifying the presence of be it jackhammer, siren, person, dog barking, basically any type of sound that might be interesting for us to study as part of this work. Um, and it's a challenging problem because first of all, there are tons of different types of sources that we might want to recognize, right? So our vocabulary is potentially huge. Um, there's a lot of background noise, right? So we're working outdoors. This is not uh, unlike music where often, if, unless you're working with live recordings, if you're in a studio conditions, everything is very perfectly recorded and quiet here. It's just a single microphone capturing an entire environment. But sometimes the noise is actually what you're trying to identify, right? So like you hear this drilling in the background, that's actually the source that you're trying to pinpoint. So even the very concept of what's the background and what do you actually want to detect is something that we have to work to define. Um, and unlike other signals like speech or music, it doesn't really have some sort of large scale structure, right, that we can exploit. Like in language, you can build language models and then you can use those to constrain um, the detections of, of your NLP system. In our case, we don't really have that other than very broad fluctuations like day versus night, weekend versus weekday. But you know, we have no guarantee that if we heard a jackhammer five minutes later, we'll hear a siren. There's, there, there's no link between these things. So we started tackling this problem um, in multiple steps. The first one was building a taxonomy, right? So we first had to, if you want to classify things, those things first need to be grouped into different categories. Um, so we started building a taxonomy of urban sounds. You can see, you can't really see it, but basically starting with the entire environment, we divided it into human sounds, nature, mechanical sounds, and music, musical sounds. So really I think the mechanical sounds is the broadest category we have here because it includes construction and it also includes traffic. I think here a bit of a zoomed in version so you can see motorized transport divides into uh, marine, rail transportation, road transportation, airborne transportation, and then within there we split it further, further down. So this was for us the first step just to understand how do we distinguish between different concepts and how should we organize those concepts as humans before we try to build a machine to do this for us. Um, since then, those of you who are familiar with the audio set data set that Google has just released, they also coupled with the data set, they've released a giant taxonomy as well. Uh, much, much, much larger than this, uh, inspired in a very small uh, way by our taxonomy, so that was nice. Um, but yeah, I think that moving forward, we'll probably try and, and, and merge these two together so that they, uh, they speak to each other nicely. So we built a little data set from Freesound. So we crawled Freesound based on like different tags and sounds that we want to find. Um, and we ended up building a data set of uh, a little under 9,000 recordings, where every recording is just a short snippet containing one of 10 different types of sounds. Um, it's called the Urban Sound 8K data set. It's uh, publicly available. You can download it. You can play around with it. So um, if you just Google Urban Sound 8K, you'll find it. And the first thing we did was to try a, um, a feature learning approach, but a simple one. So now everything is about deep learning. First we said, what about shallow learning? So as opposed to trying your standard MFCC's approach, let's see if we can learn a representation, but keep it shallow. So in this case, we used a, a clustering approach where you have your, you extract a time frequency representation and then you cluster it and then you take the centroids of those clusters as keywords in a dictionary. And then once you have this dictionary, you can just take any incoming sound um, you can take the dot product of its representation with the dictionary and that gives you your feature representation. And it's a fixed dimensionality because we then summarize it over time. And once you have this representation, you can just feed that into your supervised classifier of choice, it can be a random force, an SVM, what have you, and see how well it works. Um, there are a bit of details here, but I'll skip those. Okay, so we tried this. We compared it, of course, to a baseline, which was just MFCCs and SVM. So nowadays, this is really old school kind of stuff. And we tried dictionaries of different sizes and flavors um, when our clustering was clustering one frame, right? So we just took every all the individual frames of the data set, 
clustered all of them, took the centroids of those frames as our dictionary. And kind of disappointingly, what we found was that basically feature learning wasn't giving us anything. We were getting the same performance as MFCCs. But what happens if we move from clustering individual frames to actually clustering time frequency patches? So if we go from one frame, why is this not? Sorry, I'm going to try and launch this again just because it's, it's acting a little silly right now. Some of, some of the plots are not appearing. Oh, ahora sí. Okay, so as we move from one frame to multiple to four frames, we get a big bump. Eight frames, we get a further bump. Sixteen, not so much. So basically the main takeaway from this is that when you're working with environmental sounds, the instantaneous timbre of just one frame is not enough in order to distinguish between different sounds. And the characterizing sounds over time and over frequency and over time, looking at these patterns, is really what allows us to start tearing, like separating different sounds. Um, I should just mention the sounds in this data set include things like car honks, jackhammers, idling engines, air conditioning units, dog barks, um, drilling, etc. And so then we looked at the, um, what, do these, what do these centroids, what did this representation that we learned, what does it look like for different um, classes? And indeed you can see some patterns, like in Siren you can roughly see the lines going up and down representing the undulating signal of a siren. Um, it's a little hard to see, but for children, for dogs, you get signals that kind of look speech-like. You can see clear harmonic structure. Um, yeah, so that's, for example, the siren. Uh, jackhammer, you can see this kind of very intermittent on and off. So it just confirms, okay, our representation is very sort of sensible. Um, so I want to show you a quick uh, demo of the latest version of this. So once we basically have a model, we can plug it to an interface. So this is exactly the same microphone working in our sensors. I have it plugged into my laptop. And so now the input to the system is coming from, from this sensor. All right, there are actually more classes, but the resolution is very small. But anyway, and then I have my, my favorite prop here <laughs> is the drill. Oh, so yeah. Now, because this is a, it's trained as a multi-class model, not a multi-label model, it's always going to try to identify something. And since we didn't have human speech in here, when I speak, it's mostly doubting whether I'm a dog or a child. Um, obviously, in our more recent models, we've switched to multi-label models, meaning that multiple things can be active at the same time and also nothing can be active if there's nothing that the model is convinced about. Probably if I'll raise the pitch of my voice a little bit, I can try and make it sound like a child. And so that's, you know, you get the idea. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, and so the idea is if you have something like this running in real time in these sensors, now these sensors can start identifying what's happening in the street and send that information back to us, the home base, and we can start generating actionable information using these analyses algorithms. I'm going to very quickly try and adjust the resolution of the screen. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a little better. It should give us a bit more. Oh, yeah, has it gone, got lost? Ah, okay. Is this better? Okay, great. All right, so that model was based on male spectrograms. We said, okay, what if we take a different representation, right? Nowadays, it's kind of pretty standard to use male spectrograms as your default representation for, for feature learning in classification. Um, and so we looked at the scattering representation, where basically this is a, if X is your time domain signal, it's a concatenation of weight, wavelet transforms and, and smoothing. And then again, wavelet transforms and smoothing. 
Um, to give you a bit of an intuition for what this actually looks like, let's say that this is your, um, it's, the, it's referred to as a scalogram. You can think about it as a certain form of spectrogram. Um, and there are three sounds here. Okay, so the first kind of is smooth. The second one has a sharp attack. The third one is intermittent. Um, after we apply the smoothing, they look like this. Right? So you say, well, what's the advantage of applying smoothing? Smoothing gives you um, shift invariance in time. Right? So if I now were to take the signal, move it a little forward, a little backwards, it looks the same. Um, but the, the problem is, is that we've now lost the temporal characteristics of the signal. And that's why, given this, we now apply again this filter bank. And this filter bank is now applied to each frequency band of this signal independently. So I'm going to show you what this transformation looks like just for one frequency band and it looks like this. So suddenly here you can see the onset and the offset, here you can see the sharp onset, and here since there's actually a frequency of intermittent sound, it, in, in the scattering of presentation it appears as a frequency. And so now basically we have these two representations which combined tell us both about the average timbre of the sound and about its temporal evolution. So we took exactly the same framework of shallow feature learning with a dictionary, but we swapped out the MEL spectrogram for this clustering representation. Um, and what we found is that the results weren't significantly better, but interestingly, we could use much smaller dictionaries. So with the MEL spectrogram, as we used bigger dictionaries, we got be better results. And that makes sense, because the representation is not shift invariant. So you need to shift it many times and learn a centroid for each one of those shifts to still be able to represent all sounds. Moving to the scattering, we're able to reduce the size of the dictionary by an order of magnitude and still get the same performance. So basically what we got is a much more efficient representation that allows us to build smaller models, faster to train, faster to run inference on, and still perform the same. I'm going to skip this. Okay, and then the, the next obvious step is we're saying, okay, so we noticed, we, we observed two things. One, time frequency is important, right? You can't characterize environmental sounds just over time nor over frequency, you need time frequency. And the second thing we observed is that shift invariance gives us better performance. So a convolutional network does exactly that, right? It, it basically learns time frequency patterns or two-dimensional patterns at the function of your input representation and it's shift invariant in time and frequency. If you're using spectrograms, it's not shift invariant, but if you use a logarithmically scaled frequency axis like constant Q or MEL spectrogram except for the bottom range, which is linear, then, then you have a representation that's um, where it makes sense to use these convolutional filters. So uh, we tried uh, what nowadays I think is fair to say a super vanilla convolutional network, right? It's like really nothing complicated. We have three layers. Uh, three convolutional layers followed by uh, two dense layers, um, training using the standard bag of tricks, nothing special. And kind of disappointingly, we observed, so this is the shallow feature learning. This is another deep model that uh, someone proposed, and this was the deep model that we were trying. And we're like, oh, it doesn't actually work better. So it failed to outperform the shallow model. Um, and the same happened with this, with this other model. And so the question is, is it that the model is just not, it's just not useful for this problem, it's not better? Um, but we said maybe the problem is, is that we don't have enough data, right? As we know, these models can tend to be very data hungry. They require a lot of data to learn meaningful discriminative representations. And so um, we turned to Muda, which is a tool uh, developed by Brian McPhee, who is also currently at NYU. He was at Columbia before that, which is a augmentation framework for music. So he originally designed it with MIR research in mind, but we've been happily applying it to environmental sound for a long time now. It's open source, and so again, I encourage you to, um, to try it and play around with it. And it's basically given a single, um, a single audio signal, you can apply a variety of transformations like adding noise, pitch shifting, time stretching in order to generate transformed versions of the signal. And when we're using this to train models, as long as we don't transform it too much to the point where it's no longer a valid representation of the signal, we can use this technique 
in order to generate more data from our existing data, add variance into our training data, and hopefully improve the generalizability of our models, and in particular convolutional models. So going back to, to these results, we had our, our, our shallow approach, two CNNs. What happens when we add the augmented data? Basically, you, we used Muda to make a data set that was 20 times the size of the original data set. And we then trained both the channel model and the deep model using this larger data set. And what we found was that in both cases they improved, but actually the convolutional network improved significantly more than the shallow learning approach. And so here we're starting to see that, um, yes, we just didn't have enough data in order to train a convolutional network. And once we do have more data, not only does it improve, but it significantly outperforms a shallower representation. Uh, I'll skip this. So just the one last anecdote I'll mention about data augmentation. Here what we did is we took, we broke down the different classes uh, in our data set. And for each one, we checked how each of the different data transformations, augmentations, affects classification. So if the, if the bars are moving this way, it means it performed, the classification for that sound was better for that class. But if the bars are in this way, it means that they were worse. And so you can actually see that there are some classes for which applying data transformations actually reduced the accuracy of detecting those sound classes. So the conclusion from there is that maybe we don't want to just Wholesale apply, wholesale apply all of our transformations to all of our data. Maybe we want to apply different transformations to different classes. So this is again uh, the demo that I showed you before. Here there are some uh, recorded sounds. Of course, none of the recorded sounds are sounds that were used for training. Um, so I'll just quickly play this to you. And this runs in real time with the CNN as the back end for performing classification. <laughs> Now you see that it first takes a while before it settles on a, on a classification and that's because we're using a context window of four seconds for this model. And so it, it takes about four seconds of the audio coming in before it actually kind of uh, hooks into something. So from these experiments we basically saw that yes, feature learning helps rather than using your standard MFCC representation say. Um, and that for environmental sound, we uh, shift invariance models that build in shift invariance, incre increase the generalizability of the model. Um, for large models, we, need, we just need more data. Data augmentation help, but is class dependent. Um, and data really seems to be the bottleneck. And so recently, Google released AudioSet, which is a data set of two million, I think, YouTube videos including tags, annotations of what sounds are in those videos. Um, and they also released a paper where they trained a bunch of very deep convolutional models on that data. Now the nice thing with a convolutional network is that you can, at any point in the network, you can just cut it with scissors and compute the intermediate representation that that network computes. Right? And so the hope is, is that if this network has learned a meaningful discriminative audio representation, that that representation might also be useful for solving other problems, which is also sometimes referred to as transfer learning or just boring embeddings. So what we did was uh, they've released their model, which basically you can use that model to compute uh, the embedding that Google learned after training a model on two million YouTube videos. And then you can try and leverage it for your own problems. And so we said, okay, well, let's take Urban Sound 8K and extract features using Google's model that was trained on 2 million videos, which would take us a very, very, very long time to do. And then once we have this feature representation, let's just throw it into a simple classifier like an SVM. Okay? Now for context, the best result we got before using our CNN and data augmentation and basically all the tricks that we could throw at it was 79% classification accuracy, okay? Using these deep, this deep embedding without data augmentation, just directly on the limited data set that we have, we got 79%. Um, and so kind of the moral of the story here, perhaps a little sadly, is that 
the more data you have, really the better you're going to do, right? It re and there was a recent paper where they tried data sets of increasing orders of magnitude of data, and they kept seeing an improvement in model performance. And so you can, if you have a small data set, you have to try all of these little tricks and you can apply augmentation, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have a very, very large data set, you can use relatively simple architectures, and if you just throw enough data at it, it seems like you're going to learn a representation that's highly discriminative. But should that mean that we should just throw out of the window all of the DSP knowledge and the kind of specific observations that we've made over the last three years studying this problem and just take like, you know, these uber-trained models and, and see what happens? No, it turns out that the answer is not necessarily yes. And so we've been also looking at, so that Google model is trained on MEL spectrograms. Our CNN was trained on MEL spectrograms. But we saw before that with, when we did the dictionary learning thing, actually using a scattering representation worked better. So we said, okay, let's now, we're working with convolutional networks, let's revisit the idea of this scattering representation, except that now we're using a time frequency scattering representation. So now, once you have, let's say, something that looks like your spectrogram, you perform a two-dimensional wavelet transform on that representation. Okay, so now these wav wavelets represent information both in time and frequency in a joint fashion. And so we have this scattering representation, and remember that this representation is hierarchical, right? You do a wavelet transform, and then you smooth. And then you do a wavelet transform, and then you smooth. So the representation goes from being as fine as possible to being as coarse as possible, right? Very smooth and averaged over time. At the same time, when you're working with a convolutional network, you're going deeper and deeper and deeper. And so we said, well, how can we combine these two things in a way that makes sense? And we came up with a model that at the moment we're nicknicking, nick, nick, uh, we're, we're naming the snowball model because it looks a bit like a snowball rolling, and as it rolls and rolls and rolls, it collects more and more information. So blue represents the convolutional architecture, which kind of goes deeper and deeper and deeper, and yellow represents the scattering representation, which becomes coarser and coarser and coarser. And so at every depth of the architecture, we combine the intermediate representation with another scattering representation. So if I zoom in into just one of these modules, it looks like this, right? You have your standard convolution, nonlinearity, and then pooling operators. That's like one building block of a convolutional network. And then this is one building block of a scattering transform, right? A wavelet transform, and then the modulus, which filters and smooths. Um, sorry, a modulus, and then the low-pass filter, which smooths the representation for the next level. So this is one block, and then we concatenated a whole bunch of these together. And then we trained it, and this is fresh out of the oven, this literally, we got this result last week, but suddenly from 79% per, uh, accuracy, we got a jump to 91%. All right, so um, I don't really want to kind of give you any conclusions on this just yet, because this is still very fresh for us, but I guess the only moral of the story is, is that the, the jury is still out about which representations are the most useful or the most amenable for training audio classification models, right? You have models working from the raw signal, models working on spectrograms, MEL spectrograms. For this problem, where time frequency patterns are really important, a scattering representation which specifically tries to extract that information from the signal seems to give us a very significant bump in performance. All right, so that's sneak peek number two, because this is not published yet either. And third thing that's not published yet is, so all of the problems I've mentioned so far have been on the Urban Sound 8K data set. And that data set, in every sound, there is a, in every audio recording, there's only one class. And so as you saw in the demo, if you train a model on such a data set, you get a multi-class model, which means the model always tries to classify something. And that's not really what you want to deploy in a sensor out in the street, right? Because sometimes there's nothing of interest. And you don't want to force the model to say this is something when maybe it's just nothing. So that's one limitation of using multi-class models. Um, another limitation is that you can't have overlapping sounds, right? Because it's always forced to predict just one class. Um, and then a third limitation of all of this thing is that we require, um, we need to tell the model exactly when the sound starts and when the sound ends. 
right? So let's say if we had a 30 minutes recording, these, the, these models I've shown you, you'd basically tell them between seconds five and 10, there is a siren. And then I would cut out the siren and I would train the model just on the siren. And so these labels, um, henceforth, I will refer to them as strong labels, okay? They're labels that tell you if this is time, exactly where in time different sounds happen. Weak labels, on the other hand, is let's say you get a 10 second recording or a 30 second recording and you're just told, I don't know where the sounds are happening, but somewhere in this recording there's a siren, there's a truck horn, and there's some screaming. That's all I know. I don't know where it happens. And so for us the question was, and, then, and the data set that Google released, all you said is like that. You have 2 million 10 second clips and all they give you are the weak labels. They say these are the sounds that are in here. And so for us the question was, given audio and weak labels, can we train a model that will give us strong labels? Can we train a model that will go from not knowing where the sounds are to telling us exactly where the sounds are? And it so happens that that's also one of the challenges that they chose for uh, D-Case. For those of you who are not familiar with D-Case, it's kind of like Merix, but for environmental sound. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Merix, it's like Kaggle for music uh, analysis problems. And so we participated in this, and uh, basically our solution is based on a convolutional recurrent architecture with uh, a soft max pool layer. And so that's kind of the novelty there is in the pooling. Um, if you want to chat more about this, I'm happy to go into details, but I felt like that's a, a, little, a little too in the weeds for, for this talk, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna get into details about this technique. All I will mention is that the results are gonna be published this Friday of the challenge. So we'll see how we did then. All right. So that's kind of a very, very quick overview of what we've been doing over the last four years for environmental noise, urban noise. But I mentioned that in parallel we have this bird project. And basically what we've been doing is we've been taking the same techniques and translating them across domains from urban environmental noise to bioacoustic species recognition. And so I'm going to really whiz through this because you've basically seen all of the techniques already. Why do we care about classifying the sounds made by birds? Well, the folks at Cornell University really like building models that look something like this, right? So this is for a specific species of bird, the white-throated sparrow. Over time, they want to know where the populations of this bird lives, right? Birds are fantastic indicators of uh, ec you know, uh, ec ecolo ecologic health. So sometimes if you start noticing big differences in bird populations, it probably means that there's something messed up with the environment as well. Um, uh, you also just don't want birds flying through airports and getting sucked into plane engines and crashing the planes. So um, there are a whole bunch of reasons why we might want to study the migration of birds, or at least the folks at Cornell University want to study the migration of birds. It leads to new biological insights and it can help in de developing conservation applications. So they've been trying to attack this problem um, from a number of angles. Um, and in particular, they have a very, very successful citizen science project called eBird because there are a lot of people, that, uh, let's refer to them as birders or bird watchers. They like to go out and observe birds and make lists of those birds. Um, and they've managed to tap into that existing community and actually convince them to upload their lists online. Um, if you're curious how they did that, initially they said, help the scientists, share your observations with us. Nobody participated. Then they added scores and top, you know, top 10 contributors and compare your lists with those of your peers. And suddenly the thing just exploded. So sometimes a bit of healthy competition can get you a long way. The other source of information they have is radar. Okay, so this is radar designed to measure weather, but if you have large flocks of birds flying in the same direction, that will actually show up, it will light up. Uh, and different types of, ra uh, of radar. So these are the kind of two sources of information they have right now. What are the problems? When people go out to watch birds, they do it during the day, so they don't get any nocturnal observations, but that's when most of the species that we're interested in migrate. They migrate during the night. The other problem is that the radar does tell you something about the quantity of birds and the direction, but it tells you nothing about the specific species, right? It's just a cloud flying in a certain direction. So the idea is to add audio as the missing bit of the puzzle. If you have a sensor deployed out in the field, the birds fly over the sensor as they migrate. When they fly, they emit a sound called a flight call, which is very, very short. So this is not like bird song, which is long and elaborate. It's very short. 
But it turns out that different species emit different such sounds, and so you can go back from the sound that they emit to the species of the bird. So uh, here is an oven bird. Here is a spectral, spectral representation of what the flight call of an oven bird looks like. Um, and as I note, mentioned, it's much, much, much shorter than bird song. It's literally um, usually between 50 and 200 milliseconds. Uh, and it's produced primarily during migration. So I'm going to play one for you now, but you have to be very careful, otherwise you'll just miss it. OK? <laughs> That's a flight call. Um, and so we looked at the data. We compiled a data set of 43 species. In the photo, there are 48. Here are their flight calls all concatenated together. To the naked eye, it just all sounds the same if we slow them down you can actually start to audibly hear differences in these calls. So again, we have a very similar problem. We have some phenomenon in the environment that generates an acoustic signature, and our goal is to classify that signature into a certain tag or label. Why not try exactly the same family of techniques? Now, in this general problem of migration monitoring, again, there are many moving parts, many problems to solve. So one of them is dealing with things that are not birds at all, like frogs and alarms and people. The other one is tar classifying the sound to a specific species once you know that it is a bird. And the other one is what happens if you have overlapping calls. So right now, we're just focusing on this middle one. So again, I'm not claiming, we're not claiming to solve everything. I'll skip all of the whiz bang claims. So we started again with, we, tr we tried the dictionary learning approach first, which you're now uh, by now familiar with. Um, and then we compared that to a convolutional network. So we basically did, took exactly the techniques we had for urban sound. We said, how do these compare and contrast when we try to apply them to birds? Um, and as we did with urban sounds, we applied data augmentation. So um, for those of you who are still kind of wondering what, what do we mean by these transformations, if you think about images, let's say you have an image of a stop sign, you can transform it in many different ways, and all of these images will still be images of a stop sign. So as long as you don't transform the image to the point where it no longer looks like a stop sign, you can use these transformed images to train your model. So um, again, we used Muda for this, um, and we applied a whole bunch of transformations. And to give you an idea of what these transformations sound like, tweet, tweet. Let's say that that's your common bird, because if I do this on the actual bird sounds, it's way too short, right, to ever recognize. So let's play our common bird once again. Tweet, tweet. OK, now uh, let's play that. Um, tweet, tweet. Pitch shifted. Tweet, tweet. Time stretched. Tweet, tweet. Compressed. Tweet, tweet. And with background noise, OK? Those are the transformations that we've been applying throughout this whole talk. Um, so if I do this on the actual signal of a bird, it's, actually, it's very hard to really notice the differences. Original, compressed, with noise, pitch shifted, and time stretched. The only thing we have to be careful when we're working with biological sounds is that we don't transform the signal to the point where it's no longer representative of the species. So we had to work closely with our ornithologist friends and play them the different transformations and different ranges of pitch shifting to make sure that we're not invalidating the signal and getting something like this, which would no longer be. And we compared it to an MFCC baseline as before. Uh, we worked on this data set, again, online, freely available. Feel free to download and play around with it. Um, all of the, the things I'm saying are online, you can find on my website. So if you want like a one-stop place for finding data sets, codes, libraries, uh, justinsalomon.com. And uh, the, the, it, the data set is very unbalanced. There's specifically one Magnolia Warbler. There are many more of those in the data set. So if you just were to predict the majority class, your zero R classifier in Weka, for those who remember Weka, um, the kind of baseline accuracy is 23%. Okay, so the question is, can we do better than 23%? Um, and what we found was that feature learning kicks ass, does much better than MFCCs, convolutional network, uh, disappointingly, doesn't do better than the shallow model. Um, and this is with augmentation. If we train the CNN without augmentation, it does even worse. So we said, okay, that's kind of a bummer. It doesn't really do much better. Does do they learn the same model? Do they make the same mistakes? Right? Does the CNN 
and the shallow dictionary model, do they make the same mistake? So what we did was we took the confusion matrix from the CNN and we subtracted from it the confusion matrix of the dictionary learning approach. And then what you get is a, what I like to refer to as a delta confusion matrix. So basically, if the two models are making exactly the same mistakes, the delta matrix would be zero everywhere. If it's not zero somewhere, it means that one model made more mistakes than the other. So along the diagonal, um, base, and, and so the interesting thing is that especially along the diagonal, we're seeing that some are blue, meaning negative, and some are red which basically means that one model is doing better for some species and the other model is doing better for other species. They are not making the same mistakes. So we have two models and each model is slightly better at doing something. Can we combine the two models to improve the overall performance of our system? This is commonly referred to as uh, fusion or ensembling. Um, and so in our case, we're looking at late fusion, which means that the model already generates predictions or likelihoods for each class, and then you want to combine the likelihoods. Um, we had to do a, a bit of wizardry to get likelihoods from an SVM. So the simplest thing we can do is just take the geometric mean, right? Imagine you have five classes, the likelihoods for five classes from one model, the likelihoods for five classes from the other model. Just multiply them, right? And that's your new set of likelihoods, or sum them in, in, in um, sum them in log space. You can also treat each one of these likelihood vectors as a feature vector and try to use those to actually train another model in order to predict the actual class. So that's learned fusion and we tried a whole bunch of you know, different machine learning models using these feature vectors. Um, and so what did we find when we apply fusion? Yes, we do get a statistically significant bump in performance. So if you have models that learn different things and are good at different things, trying to combine their predictions will always buy you a few extra points. And actually nowadays it's pretty common knowledge that anyone who wins a Kaggle competition is always using an ensemble of a large number of models. So any model by itself will never generalize as well as a family of models. Which fusion worked the best? Simple fusion in our case. So literally just taking uh, the geometric mean of our likelihoods seemed to work well. And so in the same way that we had this demo for urban sounds, we have this demo for birds. The problem is that since none of us can actually recognize the species, you're, gonna, you're gonna have to just believe me um, that this is doing the right thing. Um, but again, the idea here is that basically as different flight calls sound, it identifies the species of the bird and, and visualizes it. Um, and you can see here that these at the top are like the quintessential or clean spectral representations of these calls. And here at the bottom are examples of the types of calls that I used in the demo. And so you can really see that the model is generalizing across time stretching, the addition of noise, echoes, reverberation. It's robust to all of these different transformations of the signal. So um, we tried shallow and deep. Deep did comparably, but combining them gave us an extra bump. I'll skip this. All right, so kind of the last seven minutes or so, uh, I wanna talk to you about something completely different, which are these different tools that we've been developing because just as we've been doing all of this research, we keep hitting roadblocks where something is making our life difficult. And so we try and solve it and then we make it open source in the hope that it will also solve somebody else's problem. So this is where I'm really going to try and sell stuff, to, <laughs> sell stuff to you or at least convince you that these things might be helpful for you in your research. Um, so I'm just going to start listing problems. How can I guarantee that my evaluation code is correct? And if I'm participating in Mirix, how can I guarantee that my code is the same as the code that's used in Mirix? Right? Mirix is this competition for comparing different music information retrieval algorithms. How can I store multiple annotations for the same audio file together? So let's say I have a file and I annotated the beats, but I also annotated the chords and I also have the, um, the notes of the melody. Right? In, right now, all of these traditionally, we just store them in text files, in lab files. There's no way of keeping them in one place. There's no way of indicating that these all belong to the same file. Furthermore, because each one of these representations of music has a different way of, uh, you know, chords is one vocabulary, pitch is a different one, beats are in time, 
Every time we have one of these representations, we have to write a new parser in order to load the data. I don't know about you, but in my experience, every time I download a new data set, I have to write a new parser in order to start working with this data set, right? And that's time consuming and error prone. How can I, if I'm working on sound event detection, right? I can take scenes, real recordings from the outdoors, but those are very hard to annotate and I have no control over them. What if I wanted to specifically test the performance of my model as a function of SNR, the signal to noise ratio of a foreground sound and a background sound? I have no way to control that in the real environment. But what if I can synthesize soundscapes where I can control all the audio parameters and furthermore automatically get a ground truth and use that in order to benchmark different algorithms? How can I crowdsource audio annotations, right? Annotation is so consuming, time consuming and costly. Can I crowdsource it? What tools are there for doing that kind of stuff? And finally, for those of you who've worked in melody extraction or just multi-pitch or anything to do with pitch, you know that annotating pitch, continuous pitch, is a horrible, horrible task. It takes forever, right? You, you try and run a monophonic pitch tracker and then it will make loads of mistakes and then you have to manually correct them. And as a result, the data sets that we've been using for melody extraction to date are all tiny compared to, you know, compare a one million YouTube video data set to the data sets used in Mirix of 20 melodies, 40 melodies, 100 melodies, best case scenario, right? The, and so the problem with using such tiny data sets is that more likely than not, the results you observe are not significant. They won't generalize once you try to apply these algorithms to massive data sets. So we have all of these problems. I'm going to propose just to show you the solutions that we've come up for these. So when it comes to evaluation, um, this was led by Colin Raffel at Columbia. And I was just one of a number of people contributing to this. We built MIR eval. And the idea here is it's just a standardized open source library for evaluating different MIR problems, such as beat detection, melody extraction, source separation. Um, I think right now there's chord recognition. I think there's close to 10 different MIR problems for which MIR eval offers an evaluation framework. Um, and it's very easy to use. So you can use it computationally inside your Python kind of loops. But if you wanted to just use it from the command line, it's literally as easy. We have these ready-made uh, evaluators for you. And you just literally provide it. You tell it where you want to store the results. What's the name of the reference or ground truth file? What's the name of your estimate file? And it will run the evaluation and save the results out to disk. Now, you might say, OK, but this is yet another implementation of, of an evaluation code. Why should I specifically use this one? Well, because we tested the hell out of it. And basically, everything in MIR eval is 100% unit tested, which means it's correct. And we regression test it against the Mirix results to ensure that the results are consistent. And when the results are slightly different due to library differences or you know, implementation details, those are always very thoroughly documented. So, all of this is just to say, if you're working on an MIR problem and there is an evaluation uh, evaluator for it in MIR eval, save yourself the hassle of writing your own eval code. Just use MIR eval. If the, your problem isn't in MIR eval, I very much encourage you to make a pull request and contribute to MIR eval rather than writing code that will never be used by other people. All right. So the next problem I mentioned was this issue of um, annotations, right? That at the moment, we almost always store music annotations. It's just text files, lab files. Sometimes we don't even have column headers, right? For melody extraction, for years, the de facto standard was just one column for timestamps, one column for F0. That's it. Sometimes space separated, sometimes tab separated. It was a mess. And so we said, well, what if we came up with a consistent and single format for storing any type of MIR annotation? And, more, and moreover, you can store multiple annotations together. And you can store metadata together. And you can explain how you generated the annotation and what tools you used and which file this relates to and how long the file was and everything. And so we ended up with this thing called JAMS, which stands for JSON Annotated Music Specification. So the nice thing about it is that the structure is in JSON, which means that you can also use it easily over web services. And there are loads of existing frameworks that allow you to use JSON. Um, and it basically, it has a list of annotations, which give you annotation metadata and then the actual data in the annotation. And you can also store file metadata, 
such as the artist, the title, the version of the JAMS library you use, the release, whether it's part of a certain corpus, etc. So in principle, JAMS is just a specification, and you can use any software, any operating system, as long as it adheres this specification. But that's a lot of work. And so what we did was we built um, a Python API that allows you to very easily load in a JAMS file, explore the annotations inside, and this API will automatically validate your annotations, so it will make sure that the format is correct. And it even gives you, um, for free, it gives you a val evaluation and visualization via MIR eval. So, very quickly here. Demos are always a bad idea, but can't help myself. Uh, let's get this over here. So this is just an example of an IPython notebook. Can you see, or is this way too small? Is that better? Is this better? Right, so here, for example, I created a new jam file. I added some metadata. Then I created a new annotation. I told it that it's a MIDI note annotation. Then I added a few note events. We even have parsers to load in a MIDI file directly into jams. Um, then I added some metadata about this specific annotation. And then if I just go jam and I hit enter in a PyPython notebook, I get this. So I can very easily browse the metadata and the annotations. I see there's one annotation inside. Note MIDI, here I can see in the format of a pandas data frame, the start time, the duration, the value of each note, and the confidence levels. I can see the metadata about the annotation. Um, and if I were to just print this, you get the raw JSON. This is what this looks like under the hood. But we also have a display model, and then for free you get a visualization that makes sense for the specific annotation type. So we have namespaces to tell you whether this is notes or chords or beats or sources. And then if you just run that through display for free, here you get the time and here you get the MIDI notes and you get a quick visualization. So Jams, is, it's both a library for manipulating annotations. Sorry. Fix this. But it's also very good as you're prototyping. You can just very quickly stare at annotations and, and see what they look like. So yay, Jams. Sorry, almost done. And it's available at github.com slash moral slash jams. The next thing is scaper. So I mentioned if you're working in sound event detection, the problem is that natural soundscapes are very uncontrolled, which is very hard to kind of do systematic evaluation about these soundscapes. And so we said, well, what if we could just simulate soundscapes and control every aspect of it? When the sounds happen, how loud they are, what sounds they are, the SNR with respect to the background. And so we built Scaper. Um, this is kind of the, the structure of uh, Scaper. It's open source. We're actually going to be presenting it at WASPA uh, in a month. Um, and what you do is you build the soundscape specification and then Scaper will return you both the audio, the mixed soundscape, and an annotation in JAMS format. So you get both of them. Um, and the way Scaper works is you define your sound bank of foreground sounds and background sounds. So you need to have, you choose your library. And then you define a specification. And the nice thing about this specification is that it's probabilistic. So you can say, give me a sound with an SNR from this distribution of values and a duration coming from this distribution of values. And everything that you can basically define about the scene, you can define probabilistically, which means that from a single specification, you can generate infinitely many different soundscapes. Furthermore, we've integrated sound transformations in there, such as pitch shifting and time stretching. So even if your sound bank is not, sound bank is not very big, you can say, and randomly apply a pitch shift to the sound from a normal distribution but, you know, with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of three semitones. And so every sound that you plug in there is also now going to be transformed. And the result is that basically from one specification, one library, you can build a whole bunch of soundscape files with relevant annotations. This is on GitHub as well. And so the nice thing is that once you have something like this, you can start doing studies like, I took exactly the same data set, but what I did is I varied the signal to noise ratio of the foreground sounds with respect to the background and reevaluated exactly the same model. And here you can see the SNR going up, and this is the precision in blue, recall in green, and F measure in red. So if I only looked at the F measure, the F measure would look pretty stable. 
But if I look, I actually see that there's a trade-off between precision and recall. So it tells us that as the sounds become louder, our recall improves, so we detect more sounds, but also our precision goes down. So we make more mistakes or we have more false positives. And this type of analysis, such a detailed breakdown of a classification model, would be impossible if you only worked with natural soundscapes over which you have no control. Um, so, scaper. And then finally, um, another tool we released is the audio annotator. So the audio annotator is basically just a web-based interface for labeling sound. Because we said, well, labeling sounds, we, we still were recording. We have over seven terabytes of audio data collected from our sensors in New York City. There's no way we're going to be able to label all of that ourselves. And so we said, well, can we crowdsource this? Can we crowdsource this? And so we needed an interface. And so we built this interface where basically you have your spectrogram representation and you can add label, you can add these you know, selection areas, and then you have a, a fixed set of labels. And again, I want to very quickly show this to you. Okay, so I can play my sound, I can skip to different places, and then I'm like, oh, okay, well, this, you know, this to me, this sounds like a whistle. Let's maybe just hear the part that I annotated. Maybe I, if you need to adjust it slightly, and then let's... Uh, um, continue. Okay, so here it sounds like there's some knocking going on. And you know, you could, and you could hypothetically have overlapping, um, I'm not very good at manipulating this, but basically you can have overlapping annotations as well. And so we were about to use this in order to crowdsource data, but we said, wait a minute, how do we know that this interface is the one that makes the most sense? How do we know if we're not biasing the quality of our labels because of our interface? How do we know how reliable the labels are from people as the audio scenes that we give to them become more and more complex? And so what we did was um, we ran a bunch of experiments um, where we used Scaper to generate soundscapes. So we had the perfect annotation, so we knew exactly what the labels should be. And then we generated soundscapes with different levels of complexity, and we gave them to people to annotate. And we had 30 people annotate each one of 60 different soundscapes, always 10 seconds long. And then we varied both the complexity of the soundscapes and different features of the interface. In particular, we compared using a spectrogram representation to a waveform representation, which you'll be familiar with from, from Freesound, for example, is the standard representation that you get of a signal with some added coloring. Um, or no representation, right? Maybe a visual representation will bias the quality of the data that people give you. Maybe you want to have no representation, no visual representation. And, and so that's our manipulations in the uh, visual domain. In the auditory domain, we defined two characteristics, the maximum polyphony, which means the maximum number of overlapping sounds that happen anywhere in the scene. And then we bucketed our soundscapes into three groups, low polyphony, no overlap, middle, medium polyphony, maybe two overlapping sounds, and then high polyphony, which is three or four overlapping sounds. And then the other parameter that we evaluated is the Gini polyphony, which it's a little hard to explain very quickly, but generally what it means is, do things overlap for short amounts of time or do things overlap for a long period of time, right? Because that makes the scene more complex as well, right? If there's a lot happening all the time versus a lot happening but only sporadically and most of the time there's only one sound. And so we had a whole bunch of people add, use our interface, label the sounds, and then we evaluated their annotations against the ground truth references generated by Scaper. Um, for those of you not familiar with how these things are evaluated, uh, it's called segment-based evaluation, which means, let's say this is 10 seconds, you slice it into segments of equal length, let's say 100 milliseconds, it can also be one second, it basically depends what temporal resolution or accuracy you care about, so we did 100 milliseconds, and then basically um, you, you round your annotations to those slices, and then what you do is you basically, for each slice, you, in, you separately compare all the labels that are present that were added by a human versus all the labels that are present that were placed there by the machine, that are the ground truth annotation. And then you just compare those and you can calculate your true negatives, true positives, false negatives, false positives. And once you have these quantities, 
you sum them over all the segments and then you, you, uh, you use the summed quantities to compute your overall F measure, precision, and recall. Okay, so this is, and this I think is also a good idea for evaluating note transcription because one of the big problems with transcription is that, let's say if you have one note in the reference and then the person annotated two notes, then you're gonna be heavily penalized for the second note, right? Only one note will match the reference, the other one will be considered a mistake and you know there are ways you could there are evaluation frameworks out there that I, that you know that try to what happens if we fuse these or if we segment them but I just like the idea of in every instant in time how many things are present really and how many things were annotated and just compare those and then you get rid of the whole concept of individual notes and the the trouble that that introduces okay and what we found was that um, using the spectrogram, you actually get slightly better quality annotations, which maybe we might have expected, but we never had validation for that. Um, and then in terms of complexity, uh, the, I think this is very interesting. What we found is that as the sound becomes more complex, as the polyphony increases, the number of overlapping sounds, the recall goes down, but the precision stays more or less stable. What does that tell us? It tells us that people, when there are many overlapping sounds, they will still correctly label the sounds, they just won't label all of the sounds. They will miss some of them. And that has direct implications if you want to use those annotations for training machine learning algorithms, because it tells you that you must treat the annotations that people give you as weak or missing, right? They are correct, but they don't contain everything that's in the signal. And that's something that you will want to factor in when you train your model. And then the other cool result we found is we ordered every person annotated 10 files. And so we ordered the performance of people based on like when they annotated each file. And then we averaged them and you actually see that people improve over time. So, you know, if you want people to annotate stuff, give them a few training examples because even going from the first annotation example to the 10th annotation example, people did better. And they improved more when they use the spectrogram representation. So that tells you that people who are complete non-experts, if you give them spectrograms and you give them some training, they will actually learn how to, how to take uh, advantage of that representation, which I think is a cool result. And then this is also coming to Izmir 2017 in China. So, uh, but very quickly, melody extraction, generating annotations is a pain in the ass. It takes forever. So can we somehow automate this process? The answer is yes. Um, so we take the melody, so that the trick is using multi-track recordings. So traditionally what people do is they take just the isolated melody track, they run it through a monophonic pitch tracker, and then, you know, and then they manually fix all the mistakes made by the pitch tracker. And that's what takes tons of time. So what we said, this is a collaboration with Emilia, Jordi, Juanjo here at the NTG. We said, well, let's just clean the signal automatically, right? So things that look like really crazy estimates, we'll just remove them and we'll apply some smoothing, and then we'll get something that looks like this. The problem is we can no longer use this as reference because now we've cleaned it, we've smoothed it, it doesn't correspond to the audio signal anymore, right? So in fact, after we've done this automatic cleaning and smoothing, we probably have something like this. So how can we use this as, a, as something that is a valid annotation? By using it as the basis for resynthesizing the track. So now, we take this cleaned F0 estimate, we use it to guide a sinusoidal modeling algorithm that estimates the amplitude and frequency and phase of every harmonic of this F0 track. And then we use that to drive a synthesis algorithm which basically gives us a new synthesized melody. So this melody is a little different from this melody but it perfectly matches this curve. And this curve was generated purely automatically. So now, your data set can be as large as the number of multi-track files you have access to. Um, that's kind of in a nutshell. And then the other paper that uh, will be hitting Izmir 2017 is uh, about a, a deep salience function. For, so for those working with pitch estimation, you know that often what we do is we start with a time frequency representation, then we derive a salience function to highlight which pitches are most likely to be active, and then from that we usually trace different instruments or the melody. And the problem is that the salience function is usually very noisy and contains loads of fake notes and ghost notes, and that's why downstream, any downstream processing we perform on the salience function still ends up being pretty noisy. 
And so this is a study led by, by Rachel. She's uh, almost finishing her, P pretty much finished, hasn't defended yet her PhD, where basically we, we use a deep convolutional network working on a multi-octave constant Q representation, which means that the network can actually learn filters across octaves, so it can learn timbre patterns, which I think is pretty cool. And basically, you start with your time frequency representation, you go through this deep network, and in the end, you end with a salience function that's very, very clean. This is the target. These are literally only the pitches that are active in the piano roll sense of the word. And this is the matching representation that's learned by the system. And then, because you've learned such a nice, clean representation, downstream processing can be very simple. With like simple Viterbi tracking, you can get very nice results, for example, for melody extraction. And there are experiments in the paper that that show that. So thank you for bearing with me, even though we started a little late and then I went a few minutes uh, overboard. I uh, appreciate your time and I appreciate you coming to, to listen. Um, if you have any further questions, there's a lot of information on my website. I'm also going to be around until Friday and I'm more than happy to, to chat and get your feedback. If you think that this is, you disagree with this strongly, then come and, and tell me. But uh, yeah, thank you for your time. I don't know if anyone has one burning question. Otherwise, we can just chat offline and let everybody get back to their their day to day. Okay, let's let's take it offline. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Which system? The, first one. the so urban sound. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And okay, I heard that there's a smart city uh, the concept. Right. And your system is a part of that one? Well, yes, in the sense that smart cities basically means cities instrumented with sensors in order to make data driven efficient decisions about how to run the system, right? And so you can measure energy usage in buildings, air pollution, traffic flow. Uh, and in our case, what we measure is noise and sound. And so this is a smart cities project because we're using sensors in order to try and make smarter decisions about how to fight noise in the city. It's an Internet of Things project because we're using sensors that communicate over Wi-Fi in order to transmit information and small onboard computing things. Um, so yeah, I think that's what basically makes it a smart city project. It's the fact that rather than trying to guess what's happening in terms of noise, we want to actually quantify that by deploying a large number of sensors across the city. Right now, we only have 50. The pilot will have 100. But if the pilot proves successful, of course, the idea would be to expand that to thousands of sensors all over the city. And now you are uh, detecting noise, uh, but in the future you may integrate, uh, for example, the sound of and you can uh, Mm -hmm. But uh, also you can uh, hear what uh, the people uh, talk. Are what people are saying? So yes. you, okay, so your question is what happens about conversations? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Privacy is a huge issue. It's something that we've been dealing with from day one. We don't want to be an extension of the CIA. It's definitely not our goal, and it's a big concern. And we actually had to also to go through a lot of legal hoops, because in New York, if you're recording something and you're not physically there when the thing is recording, that falls under an eavesdropping law, and you can actually go to jail for doing that. So everywhere where we have a sensor, there's a big sign saying we are recording sound in this location. Um, our sensors don't record continuously. They only record 10-second snippets, which are spaced randomly. And we hired a third-party consulting company to stand under the sensors and speak at different levels. And then we took the recordings and we had them listen to them to see if you could actually understand the conversations. And the result was, since the sensors are not, they're mounted on like the first level story of buildings, so, you know, three, four meters up, sometimes five or six, uh, the result was that unless you're, at, you're shouting literally under the sensor, the content of the conversations is not intelligible. 
And so that's already a pretty strong safeguard for people's privacy because if you're shouting, you know, your, your social security number, you know, other people are going to hear it as well. It's probably not a good idea to do. Um, so we know that we can't really capture conversations. We're not developing any technology in order to transcribe speech. It's not part of our agenda. And on top of all of this, we're only collecting audio right now to build a large data set in order to train keep training and improving our machine learning models. We're only going to be recording for roughly a year. After that, we turn the audio switch off. We'll have enough audio data to build machine learning algorithms that can run in real time in the sensor, and so they only stream the results of the analysis back to home base. And that way, we completely solve the privacy concern because the sensor is never recording audio, never transmitting audio. The signal goes straight into an analysis pipeline running on the Raspberry Pi, and only, let's say, the posterior likelihoods of the presence of different sounds are what's transmitted to, the, to our servers. And as a kind of nice side effect, that also dramatically reduces the bandwidth requirements because audio signals are very uh, you know, data heavy. And if we switch from transmitting raw data to the results of an analyzing the data, suddenly the, you know, everything drops. And then hopefully in the future, we can even use solar powered sensors transmitting over, over cell, cellular uh, channels as opposed to sensors that are plugged into the wall and uh, use Wi-Fi, which is what we have at the moment. All right, thanks. <laughs>